Ah, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Chris Schultz. I work at Capital One. I run an engineering team that we don't work on any specific application, but we specialize in IM, and I get pulled into a lot of S3 problems. So we support all of our developer teams. So who is Capital One? Uh, we're really a tech company that happens to be a bank. We started out as a credit card company, and over the years, we've gotten pretty good at using data. We pioneered that in the credit card industry, which seems like old hat now. We were the first ones to do that in the mid-90s. But here's some stats. So we got about 50,000 associates, you know, 27 billion in revenues, Fortune 100 company. Um, we're also one of the largest banks now. So just you can read that if you'd like a little bit about who we are. We're more than just a, a credit card company. Capital One is also, as part of being a technology company, we're, we're cloud first. We really started experimenting with this way back in 2014, which seems like forever ago. And with the, some of the features that were launched that year at reInvent, we decided to go all in on AWS. So in 2015, we basically said, you know what, we're giving up our data centers, we're moving to the cloud. So we are almost there. We're hoping to uh, shut down the last of our data centers next year. Um, our reasons are simple. A lot of people think costs or infinite scale, things like that. But really, our primary reason was to give our developers um, agility to rapidly respond to customer needs in a dynamic marketplace. It's all about getting value out there as fast as we can. Prior to this, you know, Capital One was kind of that centralized IT organization with a lot of processes, and it would take nine months to a year to get an application from idea to market. Our first production app, granted it was a microservice, went from nothing to in production in about six to eight weeks going into the cloud. So we've really kind of seen the benefits of that agility. So that also underscores the fact that we're trying to decentralize everything. And you know, AWS enable, is enabling us to move away from these complex processes and really put a lot of the power in the hands of the developer. And that's where S3 kind of comes into play. It's really easy to use for our developers. It's got a low footprint. It's a low barrier to entry. And it's got some great logging, as PD just mentioned. But if any of you are in security, any security specialists in here, you know, this really should scare you because you know, you're defining your access to your data right there. And now we're giving it to our developers. So we've my team has done a lot of work to try to kind of put some guardrails. Still want the developers to have that agility, still let them do their job and not think there's some IT process gunk getting in their way, um, but try to en enable them to do things in a safe way. So the first use I'm gonna show you is public ACLs. And it's not really how to use them, but it's how to prevent them. And one of the reasons why this feature that PD's talking about today is we're just, we really like it. Before the S3 team came out with that, we developed this small print here. It's about 130 lines of IAM syntax that we attached to almost every IAM entity in our environment. So we have, we're over 250 accounts now. I've got maybe 10 to 12,000 interactive humans coming into those 250 accounts doing a variety of things. And this policy gets attached to all their IAM roles. It gets attached to all their instance profiles and everything. And that blocks the use of ACLs in S3. So you can either flip the switch that PD talked about, or you can sit down and try to write this. The downside of this is it does break a few things like CloudFront, but we don't do that very often, so we centralize that. Um, it also goes a little bit beyond denying public ACLs. One of the things that this does, it also prevents the use of account-specific ACLs. So you can actually set an ACL that says, only that account over there can access my object. We don't like that very much either because you can't control what account a developer is putting on that object. So where do you get into use of ACLs? Well, we have all these developers writing bucket policies and they're not quite attending these sessions and going through the, to the depth of understanding what they're doing. They're writing a policy and it just doesn't work. And they read the documentation a little bit more and they go, oh, look, an ACL, let me put this authenticated user ACL on my object. Oh, look, it suddenly works. Well, they've just opened up that object to everybody else who has uh, access to Amazon, whether it's a Capital One account 
or somebody else's account, and then it gets very dangerous. So something like this blocks that activity. Uh, you really need a broad deny statement in your bucket policies, because if you, all you have is an allow in your bucket policy, and you may only list a couple of users that are allowed to have access to your bucket, somebody inadvertently sets an ACL on an object, that's not an explicit allow for, say, something like public. And now your bucket policy is rendered almost irrelevant for those objects. Uh, there's another conditional that PD touched on in the endpoint, uh, principal org ID is great to use in your bucket policies because you can do it, you have to do it in a deny and say deny effectively unless you're in your org and that'll trump any other allow in an ACL. So remember what PD said, if you have an explicit deny, that trumps any allow. If you don't have that deny and an explicit allow like a public ACL comes along, that is what the result is. So we're going to still probably keep this in place, but also use PD's work as well. So I want to talk about how we do cross-account access in one of our use cases. You know, we're bank. We do this thing called PCI, which uh, in the U.S. is a set of standards on how that credit card issuers have put out there that says, here's how you handle security when it comes to customer data if you're handling credit cards. You have different accounts here that may have different types of data. So account A that you see on the left is what we call fully in scope for PCI data. It might actually have credit card information. It might have other sensitive data that is um, deemed PCI. And it requires an annual review from an external auditor. That costs money. So you have to go hire somebody. They come in and they run through this set of controls, go, yep, you're good, or no, you failed this. And you have to do that annually. You have to keep up with that. Now, account B is talking to account A. So that means it's still in this PCI world because they're talking to each other. And whenever anything touches PCI, suddenly it becomes PCI. But it doesn't have any PCI data in it. Well, we can actually do an re annual review like we're supposed to, but we can use an internal auditor, which costs a lot less money. Still have to adhere to the same controls, but it's not quite as um, expensive. And then finally, account C because it's only attached to this account that doesn't have PCI data at the B one in the middle, it's not PCI. So you can relax some of those controls potentially, and it doesn't necessarily need an annual audit, but being a bank, we still do that anyways. So this is setting up our use case. So we've got something in account A that's pulling in data, and maybe it's a data tokenizer. Tokenization is this process where you take something like a credit card account number and you convert it into some other identifier that is meaningless in the marketplace. So if it leaked, it wouldn't mean anything outside of our company. But we could go back and reverse it if we wanted to, to kind of reverse that account number if we ever have to. But once it's tokenized, uh, it's considered not PCI. And so that data is then written over to the account B. So the tokenizer running an account A with account A credentials is potentially writing to account B. And then maybe you want something, I don't know, maybe some analytics, statement generator, running an account C to be able to pull that. So how do you do this the wrong way? So account A, write stuff as account A and account B. And you've got a bucket policy that allows puts from the, the tokenizer and gets from the analytics, but for some reason account C can't do it because you haven't set any ACLs. You haven't done anything to enable that because the object is owned by A. And as PD pointed out, a bucket policy cannot affect access on an object it does not own. And this stumps a lot of people. And this is some, where sometimes the developer scratches their head and goes, I need an ACL. And they put in a public ACL or something like that, and that would be bad. So. How do you do this with an ACL? The tokenizer can set an object ACL that you see here with account C's ID. And the bucket policy still allows that access in from account C. And now account C can read that because there's an ACL on that object that says, yep, account C is allowed to read it. No other account can, but account C can. But it can be risky in some environments. 
Because like I said before in that previous use case, I can't write an IAM policy that says this developer can only write code that is only allowed to, allowed to set ACLs for these particular account IDs. So I don't have a backstop. I don't have a control for those developers. We'd actually have to go in and check every object and see that those accounts really are ours. And we can generate a, a lot of objects um, in some of our buckets. And that can get very problematic. So the better way to do it is to do assume roles. And when we started doing this three, four years ago, a lot of developers who were AWS savvy didn't even understand what assume role was. And this is really important. So you're in account A, you've got your instance profile running in account A, and you actually do an assume role call over to, with account B, and you grab its credentials. And then you do all your S3 actions into account B with those assumed role credentials. And why do you do that? Because you're doing the put as account B, and now the object is owned by the same account that owns the bucket. And the bucket policy can now affect control of the objects in that bucket. So account C comes along and needs to do its get. It's allowed access. So it's a bit more consistent. The other nice thing about this is if you only ever want your tokenizer to write into that bucket, there's a little trust policy on that S3 writer role. And you can set that trust policy that only allows the tokenizer to assume it. But no one else in account B can. So it gives you a little bit more granular access going into that bucket. So this gives us multiple account access into an S3 bucket. If we were to have accounts D through Z in this model, it's a lot easier because they don't have to worry about the ACLs because all the objects are owned by account B. In the previous model, we we're actually writing this uh, grant read ACP with a specific account ID. If you go and add account D, then you have to go back and maybe you want account D to have access to all those objects. You have to go back and reset all those ACLs to include account D. And well, then account E comes along, you've got to go back and do the same thing. And maybe by that time, you're up to billions of objects. That gets very problematic. So our philosophy is we really try to push people away from ACLs in general and really try to get them into the assume rule. We've run into some vendor products that don't want to do this. They've been on the marketplace for a while. They try to use ACLs everywhere. Um, we really try to push those vendors to, to not do that anymore and, and implement this. <laughs> 